Alright guys, Dominic here for Kick Guru, and today we are talking NVIDIA RTX 3000. So obviously we had the keynote livestream event from Jensen's Kitchen on Tuesday, but yesterday we were also invited to take part in some kind of press online briefing type style thingies, uh, where basically NVIDIA expanded on some of the things they announced on Tuesday. So there were no new announcements, but we got to hear more about the cards and their coolers. We got to hear more about the Ampere architecture, and we even got a few more performance comparisons. So this video is basically just going to be a talking head style video where I'm just going to kind of talk you through some of the key points. I'm by no means going to be covering the launch, the cards, the architecture absolutely exhaustively, but I think I just want to go over the key points and some general thoughts I've had about the series as a whole, as we have now had a few days to mull things over since that launch. Just before we do get into the discussion though, I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who has subscribed. If you haven't already, please do hit that button below, ding that notification bell. It's just a quick and easy way to help us out. Cheers! Getting right into it then, I think the first thing you will notice if you look at one of the new RTX 3000 cards is that new cooler design. So I do want to talk a little bit about this before we dive into some other stuff. Honestly, I have to say from a GPU reviewer's perspective, I really thought this was a big surprise. When we first saw those, those leaked images and some of the renders with the new weird kind of one fan on the bottom, one fan on the top, I really didn't think that was going to happen. For me, Nvidia already made you know a big jump forward with the uh, RTX 2000 cards. They moved away from the blower style coolers we had seen for a few years and the move to a dual axial design for me I thought was you know quite a big step so I really wasn't expecting to see anything nearly so revolutionary with the 3000 series. However the leaks were true all those leaked renders and even the size of the 3090 which is monstrous but Nvidia did expand more about this cooler why they made some of the decisions they did and essentially it all boils down to airflow so one of the key things they stressed in the briefing yesterday was the whole reason for this design really is just to optimize airflow going into the GPU and out and just overall chassis airflow. A key part of this new design is the very compact and V-shaped PCB, which Nvidia claims is not only significantly smaller, but also far more capable than something from the 20 series. The reason this is important is because a key part of the new cooler design is try and remove as much kind of solid plate, solid objects within the cooler as possible to provide as much room for the airflow to leave the card efficiently. So having a much smaller PCB is a key part of this and also that V-shaped cutout obviously provides a lot of room for the fan on the top side of the card. The new design also uses what NVIDIA is calling a hybrid vapor chamber heat pipe cooling solution. So again, this is part of the idea of removing as much solid pieces, solid you know, base plates from the cooler as possible to allow as much airflow to get through the cooler as possible. So here, instead of a full length vapor chamber, which we saw on the 20 series cards, at least you know, the 2080, 2080 Ti, here we have a hybrid approach. So there is still a vapor chamber plate on top of the GPU, drawing the heat away from the GPU die itself. But then we have what appears to be four heat pipes, at least from the renders. It might be slightly more or slightly less in terms of the actual card. But we then have the four heat pipes, which are pulling heat, you know, which should be pulling heat faster from the vapor chamber into the thin stack itself. Obviously, as the heat pipes aren't a solid plate, this still allows heat from the fans to be drawn through the fin stack and those pipes, so hopefully delivering a more efficient airflow process. Of the two fans on the cooler, the fan on the top side, that is actually a pull fan, so that pulls air directly through the underside of the card and straight through out the top, and that should then be exhausted by your system fans. While the fan on the underside of the card towards the front that is a push fan, so that will be pushing air straight through and out the back by the I.O. bracket. In a nutshell, this whole cooler design is really just about maximizing the efficiency of the airflow, getting as much air through the cooler and then back out again as possible. So that's why we're trying to, NVIDIA is trying to remove as much obstruction from that process as possible. They also make some pretty big claims for this new cooler design, and in fact, 
when they compared a 2080 uh, push to 320 watts against a 3080 push to 320 watts, they say the 3080 cooler should be up to 20 degrees cooler and then 10 decibels quieter when tested at a fixed noise level. Of course, considering a 2080 cooler was never designed for a 320 watt GPU, this doesn't mean where we would have seen 2080 temperatures around 75, 80 degrees, we will now see a 3080 at 55 to 60 degrees. That's not quite what Nvidia is trying to say here. Rather, what they are emphasizing is the fact that in terms of overall efficiency of the heatsink and the cooler itself, the 3080 is a big step forward and it's really designed to deal with higher power GPUs, which is what we are getting with the new Ampere series. Talking about higher power, that brings us neatly on to the next topic I want to discuss, which is a bit more on the Ampere architecture. Specifically, one of the headline grabbing features was just the sheer CUDA core count, particularly the 3070, which has 5,888 CUDA cores, and while the 3080 has 8,704. So hugely, hugely increased core count compared to the Turing generation. Now, the simple reason for this is that NVIDIA has actually doubled the number of FP32 cores per Ampere SM. NVIDIA's uh, Vice President of Technical Marketing, Tony Tomasi, actually explained this really well in a Q&A over on Reddit. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read his statement here. One of the key design goals for the Ampere 30 series SM was to achieve twice the throughput for FP32 operations compared to the Turing SM. To accomplish this goal, the Ampere SM includes new data path designs for FP32 and INT32 operations. One data path in each partition consists of 16 FP32 CUDA cores capable of executing 16 FP32 operations per clock. Another data path consists of both 16 FP32 CUDA cores and 16 INT32 cores. As a result of this new design, each Ampere SM partition is capable of executing either 32 FP32 operations per clock or 16 FP32 and 16 INT32 operations per clock. And then skipping slightly ahead, he goes on to say, doubling the processing speed for FP32 improves performance for a number of common graphics and compute operations and algorithms. Modern shader workloads typically have a mixture of FP32 arithmetic instructions, such as FFMA, floating point additions, or floating point multiplications. Combined with simpler instructions such as integer adds for addressing and fetching data, floating point compare or min max for processing results. Now, the key thing here, performance gains will vary at the shader and application level depending on the mix of instructions. Ray tracing denoiser shaders are good examples that might benefit greatly from doubling FP32 throughput. So what this means is it's really gonna come down to the game, the game engines as to how much of a difference these extra FP32 shaders make. It's quite possible we're gonna see some games that, you know, would utilize that heavily, whereas others may not. So the performance differences based on the doubling of the FP32 cores could vary significantly. And that is again, another key reason why we really need to wait for reviews when assessing performance, as you know, claims like the 3070 is faster than a 2080 Ti. While I'm not denying that is true, it's likely to be in certain application specific scenarios where, for instance, the FP32 shader count, which is doubled, is gonna be hev heavily leveraged. Sticking with architectural improvements for now then, we have also heard a bit more about how ray tracing itself has been improved with the Ampere architecture. Part of this is not only simple improvements to the RT core and the fact that there's also improvements to the tensor core where there are now less per SM than with Turing, but they're more powerful. Additionally, that FP32 shader count also helps, particularly with the ray tracing denoising. But another thing I want to talk about is something which Nvidia calls second gen concurrency. Second gen concurrency basically means that with an Ampere GPU running an RTX game, it can execute the graphics, the RT, and the tensor operations all at the same time. Whereas with a Turing GPU, it could only execute the graphics and the RT simultaneously with the DLSS or tensor operation coming further down the pipeline. NVIDIA used Wolfenstein Youngblood running at 4K as an example here. 
and they said that if an Ampere GPU were to render a ray trace scene, a single frame, without using the RT or the Tensor Core, that would take 37 milliseconds to render that frame. So that's about 27 frames per second. Adding the RT Core makes a big difference here as that reduces the frame time down to 11 milliseconds. And then once you factor in the Tensor or the DLSS operation as well, that further reduces the frame time to 7.5 milliseconds. Executing all three of those operations concurrently, however, further reduces the frame time down to 6.7 milliseconds, which works out at about 149 frames per second. Nvidia here is really trying to stress that compared to a Pascal GPU not running with any RT, so purely relying on rasterization, with Ampere we are now getting higher performance, but with also having the eye candy cranked with that RT enabled. So it's a step forward in terms of visuals and performance at the same time something they felt was lacking from the Turing generation. There are also a few other interesting tidbits that popped up here and there, and one of those was to, in terms of general performance. Here, Nvidia actually compared the RTX 3070 to the 2070 at 1440p, claiming 1.6 times higher performance for the Ampere GPU. Now, this did kind of raise a few questions for me because in the initial keynote, 3070 was stated to be faster than a 2080 Ti, and that is a very capable 4K card. So I did think it was interesting they are still positioning the 3070 as a 1440p card. Now, this could well be just as simple as the fact that the 3080 is now being positioned as the 4K card, so they don't want to kind of have mixed or messy messaging, and they're just trying to separate that out. But it is certainly something that I'll be looking forward to testing, just seeing how effective that 3070 is at 4K. Also on the topic of performance, another thing I've had in the back of my mind since the launch was PCI Gen 4 versus Gen 3. Now Nvidia did say they have tested this and that in some applications, the difference can be between five and 10%. However, based on their average testing, the difference was only one or 2%. So not really a lot. I think that's probably what most of us were expecting, certainly I was thinking along those lines purely because PCI Gen 4 is still pretty new and it typically takes, you know, more than just a year for those kind of steps forward in bandwidth to be fully utilized. However, this could well change. Nvidia said it does very much depend on the application. So in a few years, who's to say we're going to start seeing more and more applications leveraging more bandwidth than PCI 3 can provide. Again, though, this is very much something I am going to be testing as soon as we get our hands on a card. It will be particularly interesting to see how it scales between the 3080 and the 3090. But of course, that is going to have to wait until our full review. One other thing that wasn't brought up, though, and something I do want to talk about is the VRAM allocation per GPU. Obviously, uh, absolutely no one is arguing with 24 gigabytes on the 3090. But I do find it interesting that both the 3080 and 3070 are claimed to be faster than the 2080 Ti, yet they have less VRAM. This, is, I think, is particularly going to be uh, more of a problem for the 3070. If you are using it for 4K gaming, I, it's really hard to say when you might run into issues with just an 8GB frame buffer. But again, that could be part of the reason why NVIDIA is still positioning the 3070 as a 1440p GPU. I am again going to be doing some testing on this to see across the 12 games we are testing with how much VRAM they are asking for at 4K. Right now at launch, I don't know how much of a difference it's going to make, but certainly in a year or two, it's possible the 3070 could be running into VRAM issues. Speaking personally now, just some speculation. I think it is very, very likely Nvidia is waiting in the wings with some higher VRAM models call it the 3070 Ti, the 3070 Super, but I would be very surprised if those cards don't come out in 2021 with probably double the VRAM. In fact, I would say that is probably a big part of the reason why Nvidia called the 3090 the 3090, so they can then later push out the 3080 Ti with more VRAM, probably more cores as well. But obviously, this is just speculation on my part, but I personally would be surprised if that doesn't happen. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this video. Like I said, by no means exhaustive, but just a few key points that stood out to me and things I just generally wanted to have a little bit of a chat about. 
The last thing I would say is before signing off, as always, we really, really do strongly recommend just waiting for independent reviews before you buy. Any manufacturer is going to try and pick the best benchmark for the best results, which paint their product in the best light. And while I'm certainly not saying that Nvidia's claims aren't true, it's you know almost likely, almost a certainty that they're very application or very scenario specific. So we really do need to wait for independent reviews to see how these cars perform in a range of different titles. That being said, I am very, very excited to get these cards in and test them for you. We're gonna hit you with our review coverage as absolutely as soon as we can. So please do ding that subscribe button to make sure you stay on top of that coverage when it comes out. Until then though, guys, it's gonna be a very busy weekend for me. So signing off, I've been Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.